Okay, <clears throat> so in, in Jew 10, here, uh, just to begin the verses, in uh, Jude, as he opens up this, this book, he, in verse 3, says that he would like to uh, take every effort to talk about the common salvation. That's what he wants to focus on, but unfortunately, he's not able to do so. He says, because I need to appeal to you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once handed down for all saints in verse 3. And he says, the reason that I can't do that, the reason I have to talk about something differently is because I need you, that word contend is struggle. I need you to struggle, to, to defend the faith, to, to have uh, the, the amplified version. If you were reading the, through the amplified version, it says to fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. And the reason he says that this is a necessity is because in verse 4, there are certain ones, certain men, ungodly men that have managed to creep into the church, and they are uh, taking God's grace and they're making it into licent licentiousness. In other words, they're perverting it. They're bringing immorality. Uh, the New uh, English translation says they are using God's grace and changing it into a license of evil. And while they're doing this, they are denying Christ and rejecting uh, the authority of God. And then in verse 10, he, he continues on and he says, they revile. They revile the things, uh, th these men revile the things which they do not understand. And that they are like instinctual kind of animalistic uh, uh, ways about them. And he says in verse 11, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, when we look at these three examples that are given to us, the, the comparisons that are given to us, we see three specific examples of these men, the way that they're compared. And the first one we know very well, Cain. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, we see Cain... Uh, uh, going and uh, because of his jealousy, because of the fact that God uh, did not accept his sacrifice and he, he, his countenance fell, he became jealous, he became enraged, and he ends up killing his brother. In, in Korah's case, when we talk about Korah, we said two weeks ago, when I was here the last time, uh, two weeks ago we talked about Korah, and we said that there was a rebellion. In Numbers chapter 16, we see that Moses talks about this rebellion, how Korah had gotten these different people together, and they rebelled against Moses and were trying to pull away the priestly duties. And Korah, as well as Dathan and uh, Abiram and the households, uh, their households, and 250 men that had supported them, they all perish because God destroys them. But what about Balaam? See, it talks to us here that they proceeded for pay in headlong into the error of Balaam. What is the error of Balaam? Well, going through our Bible read this year, you should have come through the story of Balaam. And it's an interesting story. I mean, it's, it's something, you, you, you have this conquest of Israel, uh, you see how they're doing specific things, how, how they're rebelling against God, and then they're winning victoriously against the, the surrounding nation, they're entering into the promised land, and then you have this story of Balaam. In Numbers chapter 22, verse 20, uh, chapters 22 all the way to 24. So if you turn there, we're going to go and look at Balaam. We're going to uh, take a look at the story of Balaam. And the, sto the, the title of today's lesson, tonight's lesson, is The Error of Balaam. And I want to take a, a closer look at this interesting story surrounding Balaam's error. Find out what that error is and then glean some very important lessons for us as Christians about this whole story and what we, we can take from them. So if you're not there, turn with me to Numbers chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Now, in Numbers, the, when we begin this, in chapters 21, 20, uh, a little bit before this, uh, what we see is... Uh, Israel has not been the greatest of people. We see the, the death of Miriam in, in chapter 20. 
uh, marks kind of the ending of I Israel's old leadership. The, the people that had rebelled against God and had refused to go into the Canaan land in the first place. And then we see the waters of Meribah. The people are complaining during this time frame. And, and Moses and Aaron go there. And unfortunately, Moses does not listen to what God had told him. He tells him to, to speak to the rock. He strikes the rock twice. And then uh, he does not give the honor and glory to the Lord. And now he is not able to enter the promised land as well. And then we see these conquests that are happening. And we, talk, we find that also the bronze serpent. We see the story of the fiery serpents because the, the people of Israel, they start complaining and, and murmuring against the food and, and the fact that God is providing for them. And God sends fiery serpents and they are bitten. They have to look upon the standard before they're able to be healed or not die. And then we see these various victories throughout all of this. We see all these victories where Israel is winning. And in chapters 22, then we come up to where the people are in the plain of Moab. And the Moabite king, which is Balak, he comes and he sees these people on his front lawn, essentially. And he says, uh, okay, these these, I know what these people have been capable of doing. They have been winning battle after battle, and they are a huge amount of people there. Now, how many people exactly are there? Well, in Numbers chapter 25, uh, I'm sorry, for, uh, chapter 26, verse 51, we're told that after the, the 24,000 people perish because of a plague, and then census is taken after these 24,000 perish, that they numbered 601,730 men above the age of 20. That's not counting children. That's not counting women. That's not counting uh, young, uh, older men that are beyond the age of actual warfare. So you have a troop fold of over 600 men sitting on your doorstep. Obviously, that would make any nation a little bit unnerved, especially there where they're winning just all these different wars. And here the Moabite king, uh, Balak, he, he doesn't know what to do about it and he's out his wit's end. So he decides, I'm going to go and ask for this soothsayer. He's going to ask for Balaam to come and help him. And in chapter 23, we see that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 22, we see that very thing happening. In verse 1, uh, uh, let's just read from verse uh, 2. Uh, it says, Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that, is, all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So, the Moab, so Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread because of the sons of Israel. And then he, he goes and sends now for Balaam in verse 5. So he sent messengers to Balaam, and the son of Beor, at Pethor, uh, which is near the river in the land of the sons of, of, the people, of his people, to call for him, saying, Behold, the people came out of Egypt. Behold, that they, they cover the surface of the land, and they are living opposite to me. Now, therefore, please come curse this people for, uh, for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So he sends his entourage to go down there. And in verse 7, we see that they didn't, just leave, they didn't go there empty-handed. They have fees for divination. And they come to, to Balak, or they come to Balaam, and they are seeking him because Balaam in Joshua chapter, uh, actually <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 13, verse 22, we see that Joshua, uh, Joshua refers to Balaam as a soothsayer. What is a soothsayer? A soothsayer or a diviner was a person that made their living essentially predicting the future. And here, this man, he is making a pretty good living in. People know him because they know him well enough to where in verse 6, the Moabite king says, who you curse is cursed and who you say is blessed, that person is blessed. You get it right every single time. So that's why we're calling for you. We're calling for you so that you can curse these people because if you say they're cursed, then we know that it's going to happen. So Balaam 
he receives these people and he says, okay, spend the night with me and I'm going to go and talk to the Lord and find out what the Lord wants me to do. We see this happening in verse 8. And he goes and, and discusses with God. Now, again, remember, Balaam is not a prophet of the Lord. He is one of those of the land. And he's a prophet for hire, essentially. But he goes and he talks to God. He knows who God is. And he listens to what God says. And God tells him in verse 12, specifically. In verse 12, he says, God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And what does Balaam do? Balaam says, okay, very well. He goes to the, to the people of Balak and he tells them, I cannot go with you because God says no. He is not going to allow me to do this. God has refused my request to go with them. So no, you, you've got to go. So sure enough, they leave. They go back to uh, Balak and they let him know. And Balak does not take no for an answer. See, this should have been the end of it right here. This should have pretty much ended this, this story. But Balak doesn't take no for an answer. He's not going to just let that go. He sends a bigger entourage now. Uh, more people with more honor, more gold. And he basically says, you ask for it and it is yours. Just come and curse them. Well, in verse 18, look how Balaam responds. Balaam responds in verse 18 as he says, Though Balak was to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could, do uh, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of, God, of the Lord my God. I mean, that sounds pretty powerful. That sounds pretty good. He's giving all the right answers right here. This is awesome. But notice what happens in verse 19. In verse 19, now please... You also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord has to speak to me. Why? God had told them specifically, don't go with these people, and you will not curse Israel because they are blessed. That was it, right? That hadn't changed. That information had not changed. And what was the request of the Moabite king, Balak? Was he changing his request? No, he still wanted them to go. He still wanted him to come. And he still wanted him to curse Israel. That's what he was being hired for. So what changed? The only thing that changes is the amount of money. The only thing that changes is the prestige, the honor that he will receive. So Balak is being offered the world here on a platter. And Balaam is craving the prospect of money. And therefore, he goes back to God and he asks God, you know, maybe there's something different. Maybe God will give me some other command. Maybe I can go ahead and have a little bit of leeway. And sure enough, God comes to him at night in verse 20 and says, If the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which, which I speak to you shall, you shall you do. So Balaam, he gets that word. He takes off. He's, he's ready to go. And in verse 22, it tells us that God was angry because... He was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand and his way as an adversary against him. Now, when we look at this, we say the first question that probably have uh, some scratching their heads say, wait a minute, God just told him to go. He said, go ahead. And now why is an angel standing as an adversary in front of Balaam? Because God has given Balaam a choice. The word didn't change. God did not change what he wanted Balaam to do. But he is saying kind of, if you want to do it, go do it. I kind of, uh, I heard this analogy and I thought it was a great analogy uh, where he said, the, the preacher said, imagine it this way for men who have spouses. You go and you have a bunch of friends and your friends want you to go out with them and they're gonna to go to a ball game or whatever. But you have plans with your spouse and relatives. And he says, you come and your, your friends ask you, you go over there, you know you have those plans, you talk to your spouse and you're like, hey, can, can I go, why don't we cancel these plans so I can go over there, it's gonna be a great time. And your spouse says, no, we're not doing that. 
And so you go back to your friends and you say, okay, well, I, I can't, I'm sorry, we have plans, you just can't break them. And they go, what? Oh, come on. It's going to be awesome. You're going to miss out. And so he says, okay, let me, let me see. I goes back to his wife and says, look, it's going to be really good. Let's just break these plans. And she says, do what you want to do. Now, I, I will tell you right now, any man who hears that understands you did not get the consent. Okay, that, that wasn't consent. That was do what you want to do, but understand when you come back, you're going to have a large problem on your hands. Okay? So here, Balaam is being told, do what you want to do. And sure enough, the Lord now stands as an, adver as an adversary against him. And we see this donkey, this, this, <laughs> this scene now, which is something just above all scenes. Because here Balaam is, is riding towards the Moabite king to meet Balak. And the donkey sees this angel ready to slay Balaam. And the first time the donkey goes off to the side of the road and Balaam strikes him, gets him back on the road. And then the second time the donkey goes and he sees there's a, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a it's enclosed area. There's a wall on either side and the donkey kind of goes and skirts off to the side and, and pretty much smashes Balaam's leg. And Balaam is furious. He, he hits the donkey again. And then now the third time the donkey can't get around the angel. It is a very small path and therefore the donkey stops and just lies down. And Balaam is furious. He hits the donkey. And this is where we have the donkey. His mouth is open and he has a discussion with Balaam. And he tells him, why are you hitting me? But you know what's even stronger about this? What's even like, wow, is that Balaam has a conversation back. And Balaam says, you know what? I'm hitting you because you're making a fool of me. And if I had a sword, I would kill you. And the donkey's asking him, well, have I ever done this to you before? And now the angel of the Lord comes before Balaam and shows him, if you, if that donkey had not left, if had, if had come through, I would have slayed you, but left the donkey alive. And Balaam understands and he repents at this. He says those words of repentance. Look at what he says in verse 35. Oh, actually in verse 34. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Now, that sounds great. But the question that I have is if... If it displeases you, I mean, the Lord told them, don't go, don't curse them. You've allowed yourself to be hired to do exactly that. You're now with them and the angel of the Lord stands before you and says, I was going to kill you because you disobeyed me. And now you're saying, I've repented, I'm so sorry, but if it really upsets you, although I hope it doesn't, then I'll go back. And God says, go. You go. Because I'm going to use you. But the only problem is, there is a caveat to this whole thing. You will only say what I tell you to say. So in verse, the latter portion of verse 22, we now get Balaam arrives to Balak and he goes and, and uh, they start to, to sacrifice to the Lord. Balaam brings him to a certain location and presents him Israel and they show Israel and Balaam now tries to curse the people. But how does the curse end? How does, how does uh, what the Lord brings out of Balaam. Look in verse uh, twenty, uh, verse six of, of chapter twenty-three. In chapter, well, actually, verse eight. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom God, who the Lord has not denounced? He gives a blessing to the people. Now, Balak does not like this, obviously. Balak says, I hired you for a specific purpose. And he says, well, I can only say what the Lord tells me to say. So he says, okay, let's go to a different location. They head to a different location. And now in verse uh, 18, 
We see that Balaam is now in a different location. He goes and sets up another altar, seven altars, and he goes there and tries to pronounce a curse again. And here a stronger blessing comes towards the people of Israel. In verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son, the son of man that he should repent. And in verse 20, behold, I have received, this is Balaam, I have received a command to bless. When he has blessed, then I cannot revoke it. Verse uh, 24, behold, a people rises like a lioness, and the lion, it lifts itself, and it will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Balaam, Balaam says this, and Balak is not happy. And he says, look, don't curse him. Don't bless him. Just go there. Let's try this one more time. So sure enough, they go to another location. They do the exact same thing. This time they're standing in a different location now. And in chapter 24, they are at Mount Peor. And the same thing occurs. They put these altars, they sacrifice the, the ram and the, the bull, and now he presents the curse, but unfortunately it's another blessing. And in verse 8, the latter portion, we're told he, that is the people of Israel, he will devour the nations who are his adversaries and will crush their bones like pieces and shatter them with arrows. He couches down like a, uh, and lies down like a lion and a lion who dares to rouse him. Blessed is everyone who blesses you and curses everyone who curses you. Wait a minute. I just hired you to curse them and you're telling me cursed is everyone who curses you. What am I doing? I'm trying to curse them. And now the curse is being pronounced on Balak. So his anger is burned. He is, he is this close to just losing it. He tells Balaam, just go. But Balaam decides, you know what, I'm going to try this one more time. Why am I trying this one more time? Because I really want this money. I really want this prestige. I really want this honor. I'm going to do it one more time. And sure enough, he tries to present another thing. He tries to tell him what's going to happen. And another blessing comes from his mouth. In verse 17 of chapter 24, we're told, A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab. Not what he wanted to hear. And sure enough, Balak departs from Balaam and they leave. Now, the story seems to end right there. But in chapter 25, we get a glimpse of something more. You see, in chapter 25, verses 1 through 4, we get that Israel is now steeped in sin. We're told while Israel remained at Shittim that the people began to play har uh, the harlot with the daughters of who? Moab. For they invited the people to, the, to sacrifice to their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So that Israel joined themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against them. And what happens? A plague is sent by God, and 24,000 people die before Phineas goes and skewers a person and another person that has been sinning within a camp and makes atonement for the Lord. So we look at this. And we say, well, what does that have to do with Balaam? Well, the truth is that Balaam was the cause of it. See, we're told in Numbers chapter 31, verses 15 and 17, or 15 to 17, that it came about because of the counsel of Balaam. We're told, uh, it says, and Moses said to them, have you spared all the women? They are now just taken over Moab. And he says, have you spared all the women? Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of who? Through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor so that the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. So we see that Balaam was the cause of the issue here. He had given them counsel on how to actually hurt Israel. So, we look at that and we say, wow, what do I get from that? What do I possibly get from this story? Why is this story even here? Again, we're not talking about a prophet of God, but we are talking about people that know the Lord. The first thing that I want you to see from this that we must glean is that above all else, we must cherish God and his word. See, the real cause of Balaam's error 
was his greed. His greed overshadowed the love and the desire that he had, the, uh, the words of adoration that he had for the Lord. Balaam demonstrates that he had some love, some respect for God. Notice in Numbers chapter 22, going back to Numbers chapter 22, in verse 18, Balak says, Look, if Balak was to give me all his household silver and gold, I could not say anything other than what the Lord tells me. In Numbers chapter 23, uh, um, chapter 22, verse, 20, uh, verse 34, when he is uh, presented with the fact that the, the angel comes before me, he says, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in my way. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 10, he says, let me die an upright death. In chapter 23, verse 12, he says, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And in, verse, uh, in chapter 24, verse 13, What the Lord speaks, I will speak. All of those sound like great, strong, convincing words. But the problem is as soon as money, as soon as wealth, as soon as it got large enough, the pot was big enough, they were just words. He caved. He fell. He fell to greed and they prevailed over the reverence that he proclaimed to have. And we see the same exact thing being told to us. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. Here, Paul tells Timothy about wealth. And he says a well-known verse to us. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8 through 10, we're told... If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into the ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all, uh, of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Can we fall into those same exact things? You better believe it. But it goes much deeper. It goes much deeper than just money. Look in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter uh, 2, we read again of Balaam. Every time Balaam's name comes up, it's mostly, or a lot of large time, uh, it, it, it is framed around this greed that he had. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, we're told here, Peter says this, forsaking the right way. Now, uh, right before this, let me go back a little bit in verse 12, because in verse 12 sounds so much like what we read in Job uh, and Jude. He says, but these like unreasonable animals born as creatures of instinct being uh, be captured and killed and reviling where they have no knowledge will, dis uh, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. And he's talking about these people, that they are doing the things against God. And then he says, in verse 14, having f eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having the heart of, of uh, trained in greed, accursed uh, children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Peor, who loved wages of unrighteousness. See, it isn't just money. It isn't just the love of money, it's the love of anything that is not the Lord, above the Lord. It is anything within this world. If we go ahead and have that love for the things of the world, then the simple fact is we are loving the wages of unrighteousness, as it says. We must take care then to not fall into that same trap, that same temptation that, that Satan uses. This is what we're told by John. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, we're told, do not love the world for the things of the world, uh, or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And listen to verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is of the world. We need to understand that the things of this world, they are blessings and graces that the Lord has given to us. But when we prioritize those things above God, we are going to fall like Balaam. So then the second thing. The second thing that we see is that we must avoid causing another to stumble. You see, in our laws, 
in our, our just normal laws here in the United States, if someone goes ahead and commits a crime, they can be held liable for that crime. But what happens if someone assists them in that crime or does something that helped them to be able to execute that crime? They are called as accessories to that crime. Balaam was an accessory to the crime. And what was his crime? His crime was an assault, a spiritual assault on the Israelites, as well as the physical death of 24,000 people. For what? For the sake of money. For the sake of greed. How far did Balaam fall? How did he do this? I mean, how did Balaam really go ahead and do this? The counsel that we're told that Balaam gave in, Ma in, uh, in Numbers chapter 24 verses, or 25 verses 1 through 4 is that Balaam told them, you know, if, if I can't curse them, essentially what you can do is if the Midianite women come in, what they can do is they will pull those Israelites by seduction. They will be able to bring them and help and, and uh, turn them to idolatry. And now if idolatry comes into the midst of the camp of Israel, God is going to go against them. He's going to punish them. And then you don't have to worry about this. See, Balaam showed them how to do exactly that. How to destroy from within. Can we be guilty of the same exact thing? Can we be guilty of putting stumbling blocks in front of our, our own brethren? Sadly, the answer is yes. Jesus warns about this very same thing. Remember when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 and 7, he goes and tells us that uh, we need to receive the kingdom like a child. And he says, whoever causes one of these little ones to, that believe to stumble, it is better if they hang a millstone around the neck and throw themselves into the deep. And he says, woe to the world because it, uh, of its stumbling blocks, for it's inevitable that the stumbling blocks come. But woe to the man whom the stumbling blocks come. If we love our brethren, we need to be careful that we do not cause a stumbling block. But I'm going to go a step further because it's not just our brethren. It's anyone. If we cause another to stumble, we are also guilty of the same errors that Bellum did. How do we do that? Well, sometimes it might be by teaching people the incorrect things. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, that's exactly what Balaam is associated by do, uh, of doing. We're told uh, th here the, the uh, rebuke is coming to the, the church at Pergamum, one of the seven churches of Asia. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, 14, he says, I have a few things against you because you have some who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who keep the teachings of Balak to put stumbling blocks before the sons of Israel to eat sacrificed uh, uh, things, things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. You see, teaching things of the world above the things of God, that is putting a stumbling block in front of people. Teaching false things or watering down the scriptures, that is is putting a stumbling block in front of the scriptures. You know, there are a lot of things in the scriptures that are tough to swallow. There are a lot of things that we might not like or we might not want to hear. When we talk about adultery or marriage, divorce and remarriage or alcoholism, or when we talk about the uh, homosexuality or when we talk about LGBT, those are difficult topics. But the scriptures tell us about those things. They tell us what is right and wrong. And when we do not follow the scriptures and we do not look to the scriptures to guide us in those things, then we as can be putting a stumbling block in front of someone else because we water it down and we say, it's all right. It's all right. You're doing your best. That's not what the scriptures talk about. How about setting our interest above God? You know, Peter was rebuked by Christ, telling him specifically, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because he went ahead and said that Christ needs not talk about the fact that he was going to be crucified. Or how about challenging those that are in our midst? Those that, that are doing something that is obviously against the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
we see that very same thing playing out, where you have a church and you have a person that is doing something wrong. And instead of doing something about it, instead of just going to the person in love and showing them so that they can change their ways, they tight-lipped, kept, them, kept it to themselves and didn't say a word. And Paul says, I condemn this man, but I also condemn you because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It can affect. We talked about leaven this morning, and that simple fact is that just the way that good things can affect multiple different people and have an influence on, on a lot of people, so can the bad things of life. If we allow bad things in life to kind of just progress and we just kind of turn a blind eye to it, and it's in our midst, and we don't say something to the person, not because you're trying to hurt them, but because you love them, and you're trying to show them the scriptures, then you can also be putting a stumbling block as well. The next thing, that, though, the last one that I have for you is that God is always loving and faithful to his promises. God is always loving and faithful to his promises. Now, how do we get that from this story? I want you to understand that through this entire time, despite the repeated rebellion of Israel, God was protecting them. God was still there. They're being attacked without even knowing that they're being attacked. And God was protecting them and rendering blessings instead of curses. We're told in Deuteronomy chapter 3, and we're not going to go there, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3 through 5, that God wasn't listening to the, the, the curses or try, the, the attempts of curses that Balaam was trying to render. He wasn't listening to the sacrifices that Balaam was giving. He was going to protect the people of Israel. So why is that so important for us to know? Because... The simple truth is, sometimes we might look at the people of Israel and say, well, God protected them because he was his chosen people. They were good people. But remember what we just talked about? The death of Miriam, the fact that they had fiery serpents, the fact that they were grumbling, the fact that they didn't want to go into the Canaan land, and even this portion right here where the fact that they sinned against the Lord and committed idolatry, and 24,000 of them perished. And yet, God loved them enough to continue to protect them and help them and allow them to continue to grow and have, um, have uh, victories over the wars that they had fought. So why is this so important to us? It's important to us because the reason God did all this for them wasn't because they were stellar people. It was because he had a promise that he was fulfilling. See, he was fulfilling the promises that he gave to them in Genesis. To Abraham, he said, I will make you a great nation and I will go ahead and give you this entire land. He was fulfilling that promise. He also said that same promise to the people after they didn't want to go into the Canaan land. Remember, I will not let any of you go for 40 years. You're going to wander around until all of you are gone, but your children will be led by Joshua. How about us today? Brethren, I will, I will be the first one to tell you. I am not a perfect man. I know, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> no. The simple truth is none of us are perfect. We all do things that are wrong in the sight of the Lord. We all make mistakes. We all stumble. We all do things that we want to change and that we have not changed. And yet, the Lord loves us. Loves us so much that even when we were worthless, he sent Christ to die for us. That's the love that we have from God. That is what this shows us. Look with me in Romans. This will be our last, uh, last verse for tonight. Romans chapter 5, you've been very kind, and I know that I've gone a little long, but that's good. Preach till midnight, remember? <laughs> Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, here Paul goes and tells us something very specific. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into, his, into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the unrighteous or for the righteous. Though perhaps for a good man, someone will even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by the blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That is our loving Lord. That is what we learn from this story. So tonight we've gotten a chance to, to examine the story of Balaam and the errors that he committed, the greed that he, he was led into, and how we, above all else, need to cherish God's word and stick with God's word above all things. We must take care not to put stumbling blocks into, our, into the rays of other people. And even when we see, sometimes they're noticeable, sometimes they're not. And that we need to always remember and realize God loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die on our stead. That's how faithful and loving towards his promises and towards his people he is. Sadly, Balaam never learned about leaving his error. He led himself to his own demise. We're told that Balaam suffered at the hands of the Israelites and he was cut down. Both physically and spiritually, he, le he led himself to his own demise. And we just read that the error of the ungodly without the blood of Christ leads them to the same place. So, my question to you is simply this. Have you come to Jesus and left behind your errors? You see, we all have them. We all have those mistakes. We all have those problems. And the beauty is that through the blood of Christ, we can cleanse ourselves from those things. And it is only the blood of Christ that can do so. So if you're one who has not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, has not repented of your sins, has not confessed his name, and then been baptized for the remission of your sins and been added into the body of Christ, you have the opportunity. Don't waste that opportunity. Use it. Seize it. But if you're one who looks at your life and notices, you know what, I've been in error. I've been doing things against the Lord and I need to change. You can have the opportunity to do so as well. If you're one who is subject in any way, if we can help you in any way, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.